This video is sponsored by Squarespace. Hello Internet, Taliesin here, and today, let's take a little break from all that hero talent discourse, shall we? That's the war within, that's the distant future. Let's talk about something that's gonna be arriving in World of Warcraft far, far sooner, player housing. Yeah, I know, player housing is something that I don't think anyone actually thinks is going to happen before War Within, but at the same time, quite a lot of people definitely do think it's gonna happen before War Within. It's a really strange one. But whether player housing arrives in 10.26, 10.27, the war within or whole expansions afterwards, I think most of us agree that it is basically inevitable. And I think it will be sooner rather than later. Just because everyone wants it so much, and I know there'll be lots of you now going, hell yeah, Tally Player Housing, bring that stuff on. There'll also be a lot of people going, oh no, didn't we have Player Housing in World of Warcraft before? Wasn't Garrison's Player Housing? Didn't that fail miserably? Isn't Player Housing just a terrible idea? It would cost a whole raid tier. You think you want it, but you don't, etc, etc. Stop bringing it up. Well, yeah, but also the thing about Player Housing is that it can and has been successful in other MMOs. Straight out stealing the best bits of some other MMOs turned out to be literally some of the best bits of Dragonflight. And it's also something that Blizzard has stated they want to do in World of Warcraft. When I visited Blizzard for the 8.2 Summit many years ago, I asked game director Ian Hazakostis this directly. That dude looked me straight in the eye and without flinching said, it's something we are working on. And Ian wouldn't lie. He wouldn't lie to me. So why have the only attempts at introducing player housing failed so miserably? And if it were ever to succeed, what would that look like? Well, once again, I think we can probably look to some other MMOs for guidance and clues, and the results may shock you. So join us as we talk World of Warcraft's imminent player housing system. Okay, go, 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 go. Before we can talk about what would make player housing succeed, we probably need to take a look at where it has failed and why. Let's begin with World of Warcraft's first attempt at player housing, Mr. Pandaria's Sunsong Ranch. Sunsong Ranch was a little farm that players gained access to through a series of quests in Pandaria. There were several upgrades to the farm that could be obtained by building reputation with the various members of the faction known as the Tillers. And every day on their birthday, you had to take them the fruit that they really liked to make them love you. That sounds like I'm doing a Stardew Valley joke, but no, it's literally how it worked. Wow, like stealing stuff from other games, okay? Dynamic flying, Stardew Valley, content creators, all sorts. Since Sunsong Ranch was phased, individual players were alone on their farm, but there was always activity around the farmer's market nearby, where everyone could buy seeds, learn recipes, and participate in other activities related to the farm. Now, the farm itself was mostly part of Pandaria's slightly advanced cooking system, we could grow crops that we used in the various recipes, and they were fully organic apart from all the shards. Though by the end, the farm could also be used to grow other items such as cloth or ore. Upgrades to the farm included items that made farming easier. A variety of aesthetic upgrades like various animals, the goodest boy, some furniture, a mailbox, and a stove. Ultimately, no one had to bother with the farm if they didn't want to. Sunsong Ranch was not related to any player power. None of its upgrades made it feel essential to the game. And I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, wow, Taliesin, that seems to share a lot in common with Dragonflight's general gameplay philosophy. And you know, I agree with you, I do. This might have been the farm's strongest trait. Like mount collecting, player housing should always feel voluntary. Oh, let's make that a rule. Player housing should always feel voluntary. Unfortunately, the farm failed in other ways. The first and most avoidable problem was... <sighs> the farming itself. I know, I know. While establishing a farm, growing your own crops, and using those crops to cook various yummy recipes certainly worked with the cosy themes of Mr. Pandaria, planting and harvesting crops still couldn't help but feel like a mobile game style chore. Farmville was still very popular on Facebook at the time. Facebook. You know, fa oh, never mind. And the comparison was made often. Wait, was Stardew Valley even out then? Wait, did Stardew Valley copy Mists of Pandari? Secondly, the aesthetic upgrades to the farm were minor, and customization non-existent. Players could get farm animals, but you couldn't name them. And I'm really, really big on naming animals. I did it with my kids. I insisted we give our kids names. You could get furniture for inside the farm, but you couldn't choose the style or position of that furniture. There was never a place to stable your favorite mount or bed your favorite 
battle pet to sleep on. You couldn't even tell your cat where to stand. No, wait, that's fair enough. Actually, that's, that's, that's a cat. You couldn't even tell your sheep where to stand. Everyone's upgraded farm looked exactly like everyone else's upgraded farm. A situation that, in a cosmetic-based game feature, and that's what player housing should be, could never, ever work. This didn't work. Finally, and this is one of the key problems with garrisons as well, Sunsom Ranch was very much tied to the expansion it featured in. The moment the rewards became obsolete, players lost any reason to return. We were never able to unlock a portal to our farm. There was no garrison-style hearthstone to take us home. This was already painful enough during mists. The moment we left Pandaria, we lost any and all reason to even set foot in the door of our little farms ever again. So, talking about garrisons, let's look at World of Warcraft's second and most serious attempt at player housing. <laughs> Sunsong Ranch always felt like an optional extra in Mist of Pandaria, a fun little bit of roleplay that allows you to feel like a simple farmer, but only if you want to. In contrast, garrisons were front and centre in Warlords of Draenor. One thing you definitely could not accuse garrisons of was being optional. And right off the bat, that was immediately part of the problem. For player housing to succeed, actually, John Join in. For player housing to succeed, it cannot be an expansion defining feature. It has to be evergreen. It has to be optional. Both Sunsong Ranch and Garrisons failed at both. Garrisons did have a lot more customization. The stables and pet areas could display mounts and pets from players' own collections. Pedestals around the garrison could be used to display special monuments unlockable through a variety of achievements. Garrisons had their own special holiday events and they have introduced Pepe, who has managed to remain evergreen for many players. Garrisons were genuinely useful. To this day, the Garrison Hearthstone is one of the quickest and easiest ways to visit Warlords of Draenor zones. Over time, upgrades could include everything from vendors to an auctioneer to a bank. Spend enough time building up your garrison and there was never any need to visit Stormwind or Ogrimmar at all. Warlords never really had a major city even. There was no need for one. Which, again... That's part of the problem, isn't it? Though attempts were made to encourage players to visit each other's garrisons, Warlords of Draenor ended up parking players in their own personal, private, quiet homes. And that might sound lovely. Actually, it does when I say it like that. But garrisons ended up replacing cities in the worst possible way. Isolating players, bringing a sense of inherent loneliness to the expansion. Trade was badly affected. In their garrison, every player could grow their own herbs and mine their own ore, whether they had those professions or not. So why bother to trade for them? Of course, garrisons had other glaring problems as well. The work that went into making them happen is said to have cost an entire raid tier, and that was just with the generic human and orc designs. There were no options for other races, nothing to remind, say, a blood elf of home. I mean, apart from the fact that there was no flying for most of the expansion, but even that was changed eventually. Even though garrisons were a lot more customizable than Sunsong Ranch, upgrades and furniture were still largely predetermined. And that's it. That's the story of World of Warcraft player housing. We tried it and we failed. When talking about why player housing can't work in WoW, a lot of players cite garrisons, traumatized by their memories of sitting alone in what was supposed to be an MMO, sending followers to do missions for them. And you know what? Here at Taliesin and Evertel, oh, no one else is here. I'm going to speak for us all. We agree. While garrisons actually had a lot of positives about them, ultimately, as a player housing model, they absolutely did not work. So what would work? Other MMOs have successfully implemented this feature, and I know a fair few of you right now will have already written your Wildstar comments in the comments below, and thanks for that, thanks for the engagement, but we're not talking about Wildstar, okay? Suck it! I suppose the version that many of us will be most familiar with is Final Fantasy XIV, and there is a lot to like about Final Fantasy XIV's housing system, okay? The fact that every single plot for every single building is an existing, one-off, unique plot in the game that is either available available to buy or not, depending on whether someone else owns it, is really fun. It adds a realism to the game that I really appreciate, and it means you literally get to know your neighbours and your neighbourhood, and I think that's awesome. I love that it has guild halls where even the most lowly guild member who definitely can't afford their own plot somewhere can have a phased apartment to decorate and partake in the system. The problems are pretty obvious and well documented as well though, aren't they? Having literal built-in scarcity for player housing was kind of annoying enough before 
before the huge Final Fantasy population explosion of a couple of years ago. Now it's a genuinely huge game. I think we're starting to see one of the main reasons why this wouldn't work in WoW. If we are going to go to the effort of introducing player housing, we want all of the players to be able to partake in it, you know? Yeah, fancy games exist for escapers and should not have a housing shortage. Also, whereas I like the fact that 14 system creates little pocket neighborhoods outside of the main game area, I don't think that's what WoW players want. They don't want a new pocket area outside of Stormwind or Ogrimmar, they want their little apartment in Stormwind or Ogrimmar. They want their little house in the Grizzly Hills that they recognize and have played through. No, here at Talies and Nevertel, and there's no one else here, so I'm gonna talk for us all, we think that the best existing model that Warcraft could follow is the housing in... Elder Scrolls Online. And honestly, there's a number of reasons for this, which we're gonna go into, but the main one is the player housing systems in Wildstar and Final Fantasy XIV are both based as much around building your space as anything else. With the best will in the world, WoW can't do that. At least I don't think WoW can do that. I'm gonna assume WoW can't do that. And you expect that if this game ever did get player housing, it would be a much more simple affair, which is okay, because at the end of the day, what is player housing beyond the ability to just place stuff from your collections in a room where you want it and have it stay there? This is a concept that Elder Scrolls Online understands all too well. In Elder Scrolls Online, player housing ranges from simple single rooms within inns to sprawling mansions that are far more suited to guild housing. The easiest homes to obtain are handed to you, single rooms within inns that are rewarded as part of the quest Room to Spare. And the quest is very simple. There is a room to spare. Talk to an NPC about it and now the room is yours and that's it. If that is all the engagement that you want to have with Elder Scrolls player housing system, you can be done with it right there. In fact, you don't even have to bother with that much. If you want, you can ignore ESO's player housing system entirely. You're gonna save you a lot of money in the long run. And there are countless other empty spaces within the world of ESO that are designated for player housing and that could be obtained in different ways. And you can own every single one of them. Everyone else who plays the game can also own every single one of them. It is like mount collecting, but with a roof. Most houses you can buy empty and decorate yourselves, or if you are willing to spend a little more, you can buy them fully furnished. House decorations are divided up into several categories, and there is a limitation on how many from each category you can place, with the smallest homes naturally being the most limited. The most basic of these decorations is, of course, furniture itself. Beds, tables, bookcases, desks, but also things like plants, trees, flowers, things to go on the furniture, plates, cups, statues, and other knickknacks, all of which range from simple to ornate. Obviously, a lot of these items can be crafted with profession. And here's where things get really fun. Because imagine, as a blood elf, being able to specialize in crafting blood elf style furniture. Imagine if certain crafting patterns were locked behind particular goals. And imagine if you are one of the only Blood Elf tailors on your server who happens to be able to make a particularly nifty tapestry. This is the thing that has always been holding crafting back in World of Warcraft. Because the vast majority of things that you're supposed to be able to craft are linked to player power, to some level they have to be available to anyone. That wouldn't be the case with these. These obscure tapestries or bottles or curtains or whatnot aren't tied to player power in any way, so you can make them as rare and hard to come by as you like. Having only one or two blacksmiths on a server who can make like the most powerful crafted helmet or whatever just isn't practical to gameplay, but this absolutely is. It wouldn't feel like forced content, but it would still revitalize professions in a way that would even help to make them timeless. Because I promise you, you would have at least one customer, I would buy the Blood Elf tapestries from you. I'd buy them all. That'd be me. I'd be your customer. I'd be your best customer. ESO also makes good use of other collectibles in its housing system. You're allowed to place any mount or pet as a decoration, and this allows players to build their own stables or menageries, selecting for themselves favored pets and mounts to display. And you know, World of Warcraft already has two other tabs that it could use as decorations in houses. Armor sets. Imagine displaying those on little mannequins. I know we have the technology. And the toys tab. Imagine being able to have Jaina's music box on your bedside table or have the Ouna perch act as your treehouse's mailbox. 
Hunters might want to be able to select favorite pets to just walk around their homes waiting to be petted. And let's link this into the war within with war bands. Imagine if when you visit a home, some of your alts were also there walking around. And I know, I know you're thinking, but tell me yes, it I'm sorry, that's a, that's a really unfair impression of you, actually. Sorry. You're asking, but tell yes, and this is all very well and good, but I still don't see the point. Where's the utility? Ah, oh, the utility. Yeah. And that is the greatest thing of all. You shouldn't need to bother. Not with decoration, at least. But that doesn't mean housing can't have any utility at all. Let's look at the utility that houses in ESO do have. Houses as portals. Houses are considered collectibles and they are account wide. Once you have a home, you can go into ESO's collections tab, click on it, and it will teleport you directly there. Now I know what you're thinking, but Taliesin, that doesn't make houses optional. It makes them essential. If there was a house in Gilneas and I could teleport to it any time if I had it, Garrison Hearthstone style, I would have to own that house because if you try getting to Gilneas otherwise, it's a massive pain. And I agree. If houses acted as portals, that would make them essential. At least to collect. But I still don't think that would necessarily be bad or annoying, providing Blizzard is careful about how you unlock access to these houses. As we said, in ESO, certain in rooms, ones in major hub cities, are given to you. The World of Warcraft equivalent for this would be like a small room in Ogrimmar or Stormwind or Silvermoon or the Exodar or any other major city. And those are already easy to access via the portal room. Some in rooms are expansion related. The equivalent of a room in Valdraken. And again, this should be no harder to obtain than visiting Valdraken itself. Now, for more advanced houses, Houses. These sometimes include other requirements. For the most part, they usually just cost money, with grander houses naturally being more expensive than smaller ones. A lot of houses are surprisingly affordable. If you want a place, it shouldn't take that long to build up the gold needed to buy it. This keeps things accessible and, again, should be how housing in World of Warcraft works. If your only engagement with player housing is because you want to buy a portal, putting a gold price on that is a nice and simple way to both recognize its value without frustrating a player into feeling forced into gameplay they don't want to do. Why this isn't garrisons. One of the reasons why we prefer ESO's housing model to Final Fantasy XIV's for World of Warcraft particularly is that it does have similarities to WoW's previous attempts at housing, starting with the fact that these houses are phased. While you can invite other people to visit your phase of your house and guilds can share the purchase of a house, love that, the location is the same for everyone. There's no 14 style neighborhood. However, while garrisons caused isolation by acting as replacements for major cities, we do think that phased housing done right can instead help cities feel more populated, as long as certain utility is very much kept out of them. If you have to leave your house to visit the bank or the auction house, then you'd be visiting your house because you're using it to portal to the city, but you're also leaving the house to visit the city. This is why we really like the portal utility. It gives everyone a reason to collect and use houses but also encourages you to use them specifically to visit the areas around them. Houses as aspirational content. Hi everyone! What's Evie doing here today, I hear you wonder? Is she delivering an insightful podcast, regaling the community with a stream, or is she going to say that this video is sponsored by Squarespace? I'm sorry if I seem a bit excitable today, it's just that I recently learned about some new features on Squarespace, new to me, that somehow even I didn't know about before. And that's one of the great things about Squarespace. There are always new features being added and updated, and probably some that you never even knew were there in the first place. There's actually a nifty refresh page where they share feature updates, which is handy. So one really useful tool I should have been using from the beginning is the pop-up builder. As ever, there's a huge range of different styles, from sleek and subtle to whole page disabling in your face. The choice is yours, and it's easy to edit the look and feel as well as the content, so you can get whatever essential messaging you need in there. And be 
because I'm on a bit of an intrusive kick, there's also an option to have an announcement bar. And again, it's super easy to edit, update, and broadcast whatever it is you really want the world to know. And because I'm feeling very in your face now, it's reminded me of our old email campaign. Does anyone here remember the official one photo of Idris Elba per day mailing list? Rather incredibly, 158 of you signed up to this one-off mailing list back in 2021. And because I would never abuse a tool like this, you've never heard from us again. But it's still cool because I can go back and see the analytics for who received and opened our special one-off missive. And 2024, one person opened this Idris Elba email three years after they got it? Who are you? I'm sure there are some very practical applications for these marketing tools that you can dig into. Why don't you head to squarespace.com slash Evatel or use code TallySNEvatel if you want to get 10% off your first purchase of your very own website or domain. And while you do that, I will be here, still thinking about that email, always learning something new. That's squarespace.com slash TallySNEvatel. As we said, most houses in ESO are fairly easy to obtain and they should be that way in WoW as well. Some, however, usually the particularly grand ones, require an achievement before you can buy them. And this really works as aspirational content, a motivator that can get you excited even while you're still leveling about reaching an end game goal. I'm a longtime fan of Elder Scrolls games. My first experience of that universe is Oblivion, which single-handedly turned me back into a gamer after I drifted away from it at college. Our co-writer Discordian Kitty is an even longer term fan of Elder Scroll games than I am. Arena was the first game that she ever loved. <laughs> and I want to relay to you her experience of falling in love with this system in that game. Early on in the game, I was riding through Morrowind when I spotted an enormous palace, Ebonheart Chateau. Elder Scrolls Online lets you view houses that are for sale and I walked through this palace in awe. It is far too big for a single player and as far as I know, most people use this house for guild housing, but I knew then and there that I wanted it. I wouldn't be able to buy it anytime soon. It's extremely expensive and it's tied to Hero of the Ebon Heart Pact, an in-game achievement, but now I already had an end game goal. I will keep playing. I will get that achievement. I will save up and I will own this giant house. Think about how this could work in World of Warcraft. First of all, this house isn't in some out of reach, difficult to get to area on the map. It is right outside a major hub. You see it when you're leveling. The equivalent would be a mansion outside Silvermoon. You can still get there easily if you want to, so there's no reason to own this portal. But secondly, as we've mentioned, this house is mostly used by guilds and it's tied to an achievement that guilds will generally get together. Imagine a palace just outside of Valdraken that unlocked with the Vault of the Incarnates ahead of the Curve achievement. As a guild, your first major achievement of that expansion would be winning your guild hall. You could then spend the rest of the expansion working on it together. Maybe later achievements could unlock decoration options or portals to the expansion's later raids or zones. The possibilities are endless. But houses don't have to rely on group content to be aspirational. Imagine if achieving some level of renown with the Venthyr in Shadowlands, ooh, yeah, I know, I'm sorry, but bear with me, meant you could buy a gothic manor in Revendreth, one that you maybe noticed the first time you visited the zone. Even if you never decorated that house, the fact that you earned your own home that you can visit at any time in the zone you fell in love with aesthetically could act as a fond reminder of the time that you spent amongst the Venthyr. And once housing is implemented as a thing, the possibilities, they are endless. One famous ESO house that you have to spend real life money on is the Enchanted Snow Globe home available during ESO's New Life Festival. It's a house inside a snow globe. It's a snow globe house. Now you tie something like that to Winter Vale and I will do anything you want to get it, Blizzard. I will rescue Mets and the Reindeer 5,000 times. I will kill the Grinch 20 times a day. I will sell Mets and the Reindeer to the Grinch if that's what it took, Blizzard. Just tell me what to do. I will do it. Ah, oh, ESO's housing system is so good. It's so perfect. It's so brilliant. There's nothing wrong with it. We should just copy it. No. Before we end this video, we have to talk about the problems with ESO's housing that we don't ever want to see in World of Warcraft. Nah, -uh. Namely, the monetization. Remember Ebonheart Chateau? That 
palace that requires an achievement before you can buy it. ESO lets you bypass that achievement completely if you spend real life money. All houses have a gold price and a crown price. Crowns are, of course, ESO's in-game currency that you get by giving Bethesda real life money. Buying a house fully furnished, like I mentioned earlier, that costs crowns. There's no gold price for that option at all. ESO also lets you buy unique houses as promotions where there is no option to buy them with gold, only crowns. And using artificial scarcity to try and get you to spend those crowns now, now, hurry, because if you wait too long, it'll be too late. Don't say I didn't warn you. It's genuinely really, really gross and not something we want to see in World of Warcraft. Pretty much ever. Seriously, we meme and rage about the WoW store and with good reason, but this shit is the real deal, okay? This is nasty. Remember all those cool furnishings that we mentioned that could be used to really ignite trading professions? Yeah, ESO has a tendency to use furniture as a way to push microtransactions. Because why bother getting a player to craft unique high elven furniture for you when you can just buy the Somerset Nobles Parlor Pack? If player housing were to happen in WoW, inevitably there would be a WoW store microtransaction element to it. I think we all understand that. And you know, there is a way to make that work. 14 has tons of house stuff on their online store, but it never feels like that's the point of it, you know? In general, and this is well known, this is not controversial to say, ESO's real life money store is predatory and just a bit icky, and we hate it. In fact, we'd rather not have player housing in World of Warcraft at all and have it tied to something like this. And we're serious, Blizzard. Don't do it, all right? But do do player housing, this. And there we have it, our history of player housing in WoW, our thoughts on how it can be implemented into the game when it inevitably is in the future, and in our opinion, the system that already exists in MMOs that Blizzard should base it all on. But what do you think? And I know what you think. You're gonna talk about Wildstar, and I think that's fair enough. You know, you put a comment about Wildstar down below that line, I'm gonna read every single one of them. I will read all of your Wildstar comments, so help me, I will. But you know, if you wanna comment about something other than Wildstar, that would be good too. Give me your thoughts on player housing. I'm hungry for them. I yearn for them. But you want to get those opinions down there quick because you want to get them down there before player housing actually happens and that's going to happen any minute now. And thanks for joining us today. If you like this video, don't thank us. Thank our patrons who give their actual real life money to make all of our work happen. And dudes, I'm not joking. Thank you. Without you, there would be a whole lot less Talies and Never Tell. If you didn't like it, downvote the shit out of it. And remember, my name is Jimmy. No, my name is Taliesin from me and Evertel and our co-writer on this episode, Discordian Kitty 2. Cheerio.